Welcome pre-kindergarten and kindergarten students to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center. And we'd like to give a special welcome to four schools who are with us this afternoon live uh, today. Uh, we have the Bishop's Art STEAM Academy and George H.W. Bush from the Dallas Independent School District, Indian Creek Elementary from the Southwest Independent School District, and Salado Elementary from the East Central Independent School District. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we wish you could be here in person, but we're going to do our best to make you feel like you're here during a virtual field trip experience today. If you are watching this and have not registered for this field trip yet, you can still do that by going to www.tiny.cc slash pk-2 registration to get yourself or your class registered for this field trip. We just use that information for our attendance purposes. And this afternoon's field trip is going to be all about matter and energy. During this virtual field trip, students will observe properties of objects, including bigger and smaller, heavier and lighter, shape, color, and texture. Students will also observe and discuss how materials can be changed by heating or cooling. So we're going to start things off by exploring bigger or smaller and texture with Mr. Ramirez. Next, we're going to explore the properties of heavier or lighter with Mr. Monroe. Third, we're going to explore the properties of shape and color in nature with Ms. Schramm. And last, we're going to do a very interesting investigation that involves heating and cooling with Mr. Dominguez. While we're doing all of that, you can ask us questions, but since this is a virtual field trip, you can't raise your hand and be called on like a normal class. Instead, you'll need to go to www.tiny.cc slash question dash answer. And once you get there, you'll fill out a very short form to submit any questions you have related to matter and energy to us. You can ask as many questions as you like, and we will do our best to answer all of them in the time that we have with you this afternoon. So let me stop sharing my screen here and get started with the actual virtual field trip. And Mr. Mears is going to start us off with uh, size and texture. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez, and I'm going to share my screen with you so we can start our presentation. Today we are learning about size and texture. So we're going to be observing properties of objects, including bigger and smaller and texture. And hopefully by the end of this program, you will be able to answer these two questions. The first question is, what are two words to describe size? And the second question is, what are two words to describe texture, how something can feel? So before we begin, let's look at a couple little video clips. The first is of a black dog and a brown dog. So which dog is bigger and which dog is softer? So we're talking about size and texture. Hopefully you guys said that the bigger dog is the black dog. And he also looks like he's probably gonna be the softer one because he has longer fur. And the smaller dog would be that little brown dog who's chasing his tail. Now let's look at this other video. We have a gray dog and a white dog. Which dog is smaller? So I changed the question on you. So which of these dogs is smaller? And hopefully you guys said that little white dog is the smaller one. He's trying to defend his food from that bigger gray dog. Now, speaking of size, a scientist can use science tools like a ruler to help determine size. And we can also use our eyes to help us determine size. So let's take a look at these pictures here. We have three animals. We have a giraffe, a big bird called an ostrich, and then we have a person. So which animal do you think is the biggest just by looking at our picture? And hopefully you said the biggest animal of these three would be the giraffe. And hopefully you guys will get to go to the zoo one day and see those giant giraffes. They can be up to 18 feet tall. So the giraffe is the biggest animal in this picture. Then we have our person, which is pretty big. We have an ostrich, which is bigger than a person. And then of course the giraffe is the biggest. Now, as we grow, we oftentimes get taller and bigger. So here's a cute little puppy. And you can see how that puppy gets bigger as he grows. Now let's talk about texture. Texture is how something feels when we touch it with our hands. Now we can use our hands to determine texture, but we can also use our eyes to help us determine texture too. So I know you guys can't feel these animals, so we're gonna be using our eyes to help us learn about texture. So I'm gonna have four texture words and you guys are gonna try and guess 
which animal has that texture? So we have animal number one, animals two, animal three, and animal four. So which animal do you think has a bumpy texture? So use your eyes, what clues might let you know which animal is bumpy? And hopefully you guys said it's animal number one, the toad. And I know that this animal's probably bumpy. Look at the skin. You can see these raised bumps or spots on the skin of that toad. Our next word is smooth and moist. Moist means it's kind of wet. So which animal do you think might be smooth and moist? Go ahead and make your guess. And hopefully you guys said it's the frog number four. And the big clue for the frog, look at his face. It looks kind of shiny, like it might have some water on it. So the frog is definitely smooth and moist, just a little wet. Our next word is soft and furry. So which animals do you think might be soft and furry if you were to touch them? This one's probably super easy because there's lots of things that are furry. Uh, we have our super fluffy cat and one of the softest animals you will ever touch, it is a chinchilla. Those are both soft and furry. And the last word is spiky. So which of these animals is spiky? This is super easy because it's the last one that we have. Hopefully you guys said animal number three, and that is a porcupine. So the porcupine is definitely not soft or furry. It has special hairs that are actually spiky or pointy at the ends. Um, you probably don't wanna touch the porcupine, but he does have a cute little face. So texture is just how something feels when you touch it. And I actually have a scavenger hunt challenge for y'all. I would like for y'all to go outside and find five nature items, describe their texture. So how do they feel? Also sort those items from the smallest to the biggest. So that's your scavenger hunt challenge for the week. I'm gonna go ahead and stop my screen share and I actually have a special animal friend to show you guys today. I'm gonna give you some clues so you can guess while I pull her out. This animal has two legs, a beak, she has wings, her body is covered in soft feathers, and my biggest clue, she lays eggs that you guys probably eat. So go ahead and make your guess what animal this is. Shout it out and I'll go pull her out. If you've watched our videos before, you've probably met her. This is Pepper, the blue silky chicken. And she gets that name because she has patches of blue skin around her face and ears. Now her texture, I know y'all can't touch her, but how do you think she feels? So she actually feels really soft like silk. Uh, even though she has feathers, she's super soft like a dog or a cat. And her size, she is smaller than me. So y'all can tell that I am much bigger than Pepper the chicken here. I'm gonna go ahead and put Pepper chicken down. And Pepper the chicken actually laid an egg. So here's one of her eggs. Think, how do you think this might feel? The shell is kind of hard. And I have another egg. This belongs to the ostrich. Remember that big bird I showed you on the slide? So which one is bigger, the chicken egg or the ostrich egg? And that should be super easy. It's of course the ostrich egg. It is almost the size of my head. So can you guys imagine an egg that big? So here's a little trivia question. The ostrich egg can weigh up to three pounds. So how many chicken yolks, so inside this egg is a yellow yolk, how many chicken yolks do you think can fit inside this egg? Go ahead and give me a number, give me a guess. How many chicken eggs can fit in one of these? And if you guys said 24, you would be correct. Uh, so one ostrich egg is about 24 chicken yolks. That's a lot of omelets or scrambled eggs that you can make from the ostrich egg. And we can also use our special tool like the ruler to measure the ostrich egg and it's about six inches tall. We can also use blocks to help us count and it's about eight blocks tall. And I also have some other special eggs from other birds. Take a look at these eggs. Which egg is the smallest 
and which egg is the biggest? And you can point at the screen or a teacher might wanna have a student come up to the screen and point. We're looking for the smallest egg and the biggest egg. And I'll give you a hint, the smallest egg is somewhere around the middle of your screen. And it belongs to a bird that we actually have here at the Environmental Center. And it belongs to the tiny hummingbird. Now the largest egg is probably gonna be the black egg that you see right here. And that belongs to a bird called a common loon. It's sort of like a duck, but not quite a duck. So you can see that eggs come in all sorts of colors and sizes. Well, that's all I have for you guys today on sizes and texture, how things feel. We're gonna give it back to Mr. Broughton to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Ramirez. Um, the question that came in was, what is the largest animal in the world? And that would be the blue whale. Uh, the blue whale can weigh up to 400,000 pounds. So that is roughly the same as 33 full grown elephants um, to give you an idea of how big a blue whale is. And for length, they can be um, almost 100 feet long. Uh, so if you have tiles on your school floor, those are a foot long usually. If you uh, count out 100 of those, that'll give you an idea of how long a blue whale is. And uh, mentioning that they weigh 400,000 pounds kinds of lead us into heavier or lighter. So we're gonna get into that now with Mr. Monroe. All right, good afternoon students. My name is Mr. Monroe and we're going to be looking into two words to describe property of matter heavier versus lighter. You know, there are a lot of objects that we see around us today. and Sometimes our curiosity kind of gets to us and uh, you might go over and lift something and you think, well, that's pretty heavy. Then you'll see something else over here and you'll lift it up and it could be lighter. You know, for example, you know, I like to keep myself in pretty good condition. So sometimes I mess around with weights. And this particular weight is called a dumbbell. Now, people use dumbbells to lift, exercise, to build strength, to build muscle. On the other hand, there are things that are round that are lighter. For example, this feather is very light. Compared to the dumbbell, this is heavier, this is lighter. Now, to get the kind of exercise I would like to get, I sure wouldn't use this feather, would I? Because it would not give me enough resistance to build any muscles or build any physical strength. But the dumbbell being heavier, it definitely would. So there are a lot of things in our world today that are lighter and heavier. As we go through the rest of my presentation, I want you to be thinking about two things so that you will be able to answer some questions if your teacher asks you later on. For example, when we're talking about heavier and lighter, we're talking about weight. Now, you need to know what weight means. Weight is how heavy an object is or how heavy a person is, okay? Now, is it always does it always happen that something bigger than another object is always heavier? The larger object being heavier all the time. Well, we're gonna go through that and look at that and see if that's a possibility too. Now, listen students, sometimes it's pretty hard to determine whether an object is heavier or lighter. Take for example, I have two small rocks here. They're almost the same size. I can put them in my hand and try to determine which is heavier and which is lighter. And it's very difficult. So I'm going to use a scientific tool called a pan balance to figure which is heavier and which is lighter. Now this pan balance, balance actually may be like the one that you have in your classroom, okay? I'm gonna turn the camera down just a little bit so you can see this. It's kind of moving back and forth. Now there are no objects in the pans. These are the pans. I like to call them boxes because these appear to be boxes. So I'm gonna put one of the rocks 
in this box. And we can see that it goes down. That means this side is heavier. There's nothing in this side yet. So I'm gonna put the other rock that we're comparing with into this one. And let's see which one is heavier. And that's pretty close there. That is real close. Golly. Well, let's see. This one is down just a little bit. So this one probably is a little bit heavier than this side. Well, let's try two other rocks. Now let's talk about a bigger rock. That's a bigger rock as compared to this small rock. And I'm gonna put this bigger rock on this side and the smaller rock on this side. Wow. In this case, the smaller rock is heavier than the bigger rock. You know, there it goes. Just because something is larger than another object doesn't necessarily mean it's going to weigh more. You know what the secret is? The secret is what are the objects made of? What kind of matter makes up that object? And I can tell you, this rock right here, it's a very special rock. And I'll show you what I mean by that. I have a container that has water in it. You guys see that? Yeah. Now, I'm going to put the smaller rock, which we determined that it was heavier, right? And we're going to watch what happens when I put it in the water. Wow. It sunk to the bottom. Now we're going to put the larger rock in there and see what happens with it. Did you see that? That rock floats. Have you ever heard of a rock that floats? Hmm. Well, you know what determined that or what made that happen? It's because this rock is made up of a lighter type of matter, okay? It's not the same matter that's making up the other rock that sunk completely to the bottom. So that goes to show you just because an object is larger than another object, it doesn't mean that that larger object is going to be heavier than the smaller object, okay? Now, I've got two little friends that I'm going to get out and I'm going to show you my little friends so that we can go over this again about heavier and lighter. Hoppy Senior and Hoppy Junior, they're going to help me out. I bet you guys know what animals I'm talking about because their names are Hoppy and they're not a rabbit. You know, rabbits hop around. But these animals have the ability to hop around too. So let me get them out and let's look at them. This is Hoppy Senior. This is Hoppy Junior. They are bullfrogs. Now, Hoppy Senior, we can look at him and it goes back to what Miss Ramirez was talking about, bigger and smaller. But I can tell you that the way that they're feeling, Hoppy Senior is heavier than Hoppy Junior. It would be almost impossible for us to put these two uh, animals in that pan balance to get an accurate measurement of how they compare to each other as far as being heavier and lighter because they wouldn't sit still very long. They would hop right out of those pans and be hopping all over this room and they would be driving Mr. Monroe crazy trying for, for me trying to catch them and put them back in the right place. But this is Hoppy Senior. He's bigger in this case and he's heavier. And this is Hoppy Junior who's smaller and he is lighter. Probably because Hoppy Senior is has really consumed or eaten a lot of bugs during his time. Not as many, uh, this guy hasn't eaten as many as Hoppy Senior. Let me put them up. Now, a lot of times there are some other tools that we can use to figure out how heavy or how light some objects are. They are called scales. I'm going to start by showing you what they call a bathroom scale. Now, this bathroom scale would be on the floor 
And if I wanted to find out, remember what weight means, how much a person weighs or how much an object weighs. If I wanted to find out how much I weigh, I would stand on this bathroom scale, both feet on it, stand perfectly still, and it would tell you how much I weigh. On the other hand, there's a different type of scale. Well, I'll probably use the smaller objects that you can hook on to, and you'd hook the hook in the, that whatever object you're weighing, and it's spring-loaded. It's a spring scale. And the weight of the object that you would be weighing would pull the spring down, and it would have a little marker that would show the number or measurement of how much that object weighed. Also, another type of scale, for example, this is a spring scale also, and it has a pan on it, and it also has a dial to show how much the object is weighing. I'm going to take this ball and put it in there, and this ball weighs, oh, let's see here, let me turn this around so I can read it right, oh, maybe about five kilograms, I believe that's what it's saying, six. Let's make a comparison. I have a golf ball here, and I'm going to put it in there, and let's see how much it weighs. Oh, wow. Doesn't weigh as much as the bigger object does. It. So in this case, the larger one weighs more, the smaller one weighs less. Heavier, lighter. Now, there are some scales in our world today that are very large. There are some scales that are used along the highways in our state and in the United States. They weigh the weight of 18 wheelers and their loads because they don't want these big semi trucks carrying loads down the highway that are overloaded, might be dangerous. So these big scales will weigh the amount that an 18 wheeler weighs with the load that it is carrying down the highway. Now, students listen, heavier, or lighter. There are scientific tools that will help us determine that. Very important name or word to describe the property of matter. Now at this point I'm going to turn it back over to Mr. Broughton so if any of you have any questions I bet he can answer them for you. You guys have a good day. Thank you Mr. Monroe. Um, we did have a question but there's a challenge that I've got for um, the students the, which is the next time you go to the grocery store with your parents uh, as you're walking around looking at different um, food items, see if you can't find something in that grocery store that can tell you if something is heavier or lighter. If you look around, I bet you can. All right, now we're going to explore the properties of shape and color in nature with Ms. Shram. Hello, everybody. It's Ms. Shram. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Boop, boop, boop. All right, oops. Sorry friends, here we go. All right, back to beginning. Okay, so I'm a Shram and we are going to explore shape and color in nature. So I've got our shape chart here. We're gonna be looking at all these different shapes that can be found in nature. So we have squares, Rectangles, hearts, circles, hexagons, ovals, stars, triangles, pentagons, and trapezoids. And we have our color chart too. So when you go outside, you might see red in nature. You might see ladybugs or even fish like this beta fish. You might find orange monarch butterflies or orange leaves in the fall. You might find yellow birds or lemons. You might find green trees and plants and grasses like these ferns, or you might see reptiles that are green or amphibians like this frog. You might see blue butterflies or blue water with the ocean and all the fish. You might see purple sunsets or purple flowers. You might see pink cherry blossoms or pink flamingos. You might see big brown grizzly bears or brown wood from trees. 
you might find a gray wolf or gray cloudy skies. You might find spider webs or my very favorite, the panda. So we're gonna play a game where I'm gonna show you a big picture from nature and you are going to try and find what shape you see and what color. So you can feel free to shout out, but of course I won't be able to hear you. So I'll wait a few seconds and I'll tell you the answer. Okay, so here we have a big, huge honeycomb. And I'm looking and I see a shape that's repeated over and over to make a pattern. And if I look closely at this shape, it has one, two, three, four, five, six vertices. Okay, those are the points or the corners and six sides. So what shape has six sides and six vertices? Hopefully you saw a yellow hexagon. The honeycomb has many, many hexagons making a pattern. All right. So the next one, we have onion slices. So someone took a big onion and sliced it and chopped it up and laid all the pieces flat so we could see inside. All right, so I'm looking at this onion and I'm seeing rounded edges. I don't see any sides or vertices, just one round edge, but it's not perfectly round. All right, so I want you to think, what shape would that be? Hopefully you saw a purple oval. An oval is just like a, a circle, but instead of being perfectly round, it's a little squished. All right, next one, we have this cool flower. I want you to look at the outside of the petals. There are one, two, three vertices and three sides on the outside of the petals. And there is one color that it mostly is. There's a few colors, but it's mostly a white triangle. All right, our next one is my favorite. So if we look at this leaf right in the middle, I see two rounded edges on the top and it meets at one point or one vertice on the bottom. So hopefully you are seeing a green heart with a rounded top and one point at the bottom. This one is going to give away the shape right here in the name. We have a starfish, well, two starfish. But stars have five vertices. So one, two, three, four, five vertices, and they go in on the sides. So that forms a star. And of course, these ones are big and orange. All right, our next one is cut logs. So just like the onion, someone, when they cut down the tree, they took the cut and turned it sideways so we could see inside the tree. So I see a bunch of round shapes that start off small and as a tree grows, it grows more and more rings and they are round. So you are probably seeing brown circles. Okay, our last one. This one is a cardinal climber vine flower. And if I look at it, it reminds me of the star, but not quite. The sides are a little different. So if I look, I see one, two, three, four, five vertices. And I have one, two, three, four, five straight sides. So those sides do not go in like the star. They go straight from vertice to vertice. So you are looking at a red pentagon. Penta means five, so there are five sides and five vertices. So you might be wondering, Ms. Ram, why are there so many date, shapes and colors in nature? Well, there are three main reasons that a plant or animal will have developed shapes and colors that are so different. So the main reason is camouflage. 
If we look at our first example, the leaf insect or the leaf bug, he blends in completely. That's what camouflage means, to blend in with your environment. So he blends in with all the leaves that he eats because of his shape and his color. The chameleon also blends in using its color of green and yellow and blue. So it blends in with the trees where he lives. So any predators that might want to eat him, it'll be really hard for them to see him. And for me, the most interesting one is the leafy sea dragon. So the leafy sea dragon lives in the ocean and he lives in like kelp forest. So his fins are shaped just like the kelp around him. And his color is the same as it too. So he is really hard to find. All right, another reason for plants and animals to have different colors and shapes are to warn off predators. So this first example, you'll see a plant with three leaflets in a bunch. Those leaflets are in groups of three, and you may have heard the phrase, leaves of three, let it be. This is poison ivy. So those leaves being in shape of one, two, three, tell us to stay away. You can also recognize poison ivy by looking at the red stem. So that red and those three leaflets tell you not to touch it because they'll make you really, really itchy. So those are some that you want to avoid. All right, another animal, well, an animal that uses its shape to warn predators is the puffer fish. It starts off very small. And when it feels threatened, it puffs up and uses its spiky, <laughs> the spiky exterior, it gets really big and scary to tell predators, hey, don't bite me or you're gonna get poked. All right, her last example is the poison dart frog. The poison dart frog has bright, beautiful colors and patterns. And those patterns and colors are like a big red stop sign telling bigger animals not to eat them because they are toxic. All right, our last reason is to attract pollinators and mates. Probably one of the most famous examples of an animal using their color and shape to attract others is the peacock. So the peak, male peacocks have beautiful feathers with bright colors and shapes. And they open up their feathers and shake them around so they can try to get a girlfriend. Hmm. Now the flowers do the same thing. They are bright and all different colors all summer long. You'll see different color blooms. Well, the brighter the flower, the more bees and butterflies and birds and other pollinators will come take the pollen from the flower so we could get more flowers next year. So flowers want to be nice and bright and beautiful to attract more visitors. All right. So my challenge to you is next time you go outside, can you find even more shapes and colors? All right, thank you, have a good day. Thank you, Ms. Tran. The, um, your challenge to them is um, almost perfect for the question that came in, which is if I go outside, will I be able to find uh, plants and animals that are different shapes and colors? And yes, you will if you look closely. And if you look really closely, you can probably find some of those animals that um, use camouflage to survive or warning colors um, or colors to attract a mate or pollinator. So uh, next time you get a chance, have your teacher take you to your school garden or a walk around the school or have your parents take you through a walk in the neighborhood. And I will bet you'll be able to find some of those things. Okay, now we are going to um, do an investigation with heating and cooling with Mr. Dominguez. Hi guys, it's Mr. Dominguez from the EEC, and in this portion of your virtual field trip, I will be talking to you guys about the effects of heating and cooling on the properties of matter with my helper here, this Lichianus gecko. Um, and this Lichianus gecko happens to be the biggest species of gecko in the entire world. And you may be wondering, why does Mr. Dominguez have this pretty mean looking lizard as his helper. Well, 
She is a cold-blooded creature. So what does that mean? Well, that means that her body cannot produce her own heat like ours can. So if you just touch your cheek, you'll feel some warmth. Now, if I were to touch her, uh, she feels kind of cold at the moment. Not so cold because I've been holding her and some of my heat has been transferring over to her body. But this poor little creature is very dependent on the outside warmth that she gets from her environment, uh, mostly from the sun. Now, why did I choose her? Well, out of all the creatures that I have, I like her the best because she likes to jump and uh, she can't stand still. I know your teachers know all about that sometimes, but um, I just find her to be cute. Uh, now, I think also she would be very appreciative of all things heating uh, and all things cooling. Well, maybe not the cooling part. So in this demonstration, I'm going to be applying some heat uh, to some, not leaching, but to some abiotic, that means non-living things, uh, like crayons, a stick of butter, and some chocolate to see what happens to their properties. Now, how am I going to be doing that? Well, I'm gonna apply some heat in the form of fire. And right after I apply that heat with the help of leaching, maybe not, maybe I'll have to put her up. I am going to cool them down with some compressed air. You guys hear that air? Did you guys just see leachy fly off? Now I think I'm gonna put her up so I can begin my demonstration. Now, if you ever have a classmate that is disrupting learning, tell your teacher and your teacher will put them away in their enclosure. I'm just kidding. That's not, that won't happen. Don't do it teachers. Anyway, stay tuned. All right guys, I am back. Uh, I've put up the lychee and I'm ready to go. So remember, I am going to demonstrate what is going to happen to three items, chocolate, butter, and a Crayola when I apply heat to them. And then after heating them, I am going to cool them down. And we are going to observe what happens to the properties of matter. Uh, now, acuérdense amigos que en esta uh, en este experimento les voy a demostrar qué ocurre cuando aplico calor a tres cosas. A un pedazo de chocolate, a un pedazo de mantequilla y a un pedazo de crayola. Si quieren, tomen un momento y escriban lo que piensa, piensan que va a ocurrir cuando estas tres cosas se calientan. So if you'd like to make a guess as to what's going to happen when these things are heated, go ahead and pause the video and write those guesses down because I already see some changes happening. As you can see, the butter is already changing. The chocolate doesn't seem like it's changing, but I see the very edges doing something very interesting. The Crayola hasn't changed. I may have to apply a little bit more heat to it. So remember, we are observing what is happening to these items. And remember, all of these items were solids. The chocolate was brown, the butter was yellow, and it was kind of soft, but it was still a solid, and the Crayola was definitely a solid, and it was very hard, and it had a very smooth texture, but it was definitely a solid. Now I can already see something happening to the butter. Can you guys see that? Pueden ver lo que está pasando a la 
mantequilla. Se está derritiendo, ¿verdad? It's melting, isn't it? The butter's melting. Now, the Coriola isn't melting at all, so we might have to give it a little bit of help. So let's give it a little bit of help in the form of a blowtorch. Let's see. Do we see anything happening to it? I do. It's melting, isn't it? It's definitely melting. It melted. Now, I am willing to bet that if I kind of move my hand around here where the chocolate is, I'm pretty sure that it already began melting. Entonces, estoy observando que mis tres pedazos de materia se han derritido. They've turned into a liquid, haven't they? Mis tres pedazos de materia se han convertido a un líquido. Y también puedo ver que la mantequilla se ha convertido un poquito más transparente en color. So what I'm noticing too is a change in the butter's color. So the color of the butter used to be more of a very solid yellow. Now it's more of a very clear see-through um, yellow still, but more see-through color. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to blow out my candles. Te voy a soplar a mis velas. Feliz cumpleaños, ¿verdad? Feliz cumpleaños a esta materia. Happy birthday to this matter. Uh, and I'm going to cool it down. I'm going to cool everything down using a little bit of compressed air. Now, as you can see, the crayon already, already turned back into a solid very, very quickly. Now, these two other um, pieces of matter, the chocolate and the butter, may take more time. So I may have to, I may have to take them to the refrigerator to help things speed up a bit. But I can already see the butter, the butter's col uh, color, turn back into that original yellow. Entonces, enfriando a mis tres pedazos de materia, y puedo ver que se están convirtiendo otra vez. Ah, sólidos. Now, I am going to take these to the refrigerator, so we're not here using this compressed air all day long, right? It might take us too long to do that. So, we'll be back. And what do you guys think is going to happen to the, to the matter? So, is it going to turn back into a solid? And I have another interesting question. What if I just kept... What if I just kept these three pieces of matter, you know, just heating up and heating up and heating up? What do you guys think would happen? That's another very good question to kind of discuss among, uh, among yourselves, okay? So I'll be back. I'm going to put these things in the refrigerator, and we'll see what happens to them next. So, as you can, as you can see, all of the items that... I melted and turned into a liquid, turned into a solid. There's that crayon. So, solid, solid. Now, the shape did change, however. So, the chocolate that was once a square, after I melted it, took the shape of the container. And so did the butter. Now, I'm sure that if the crayon had melted some more, the same thing would have happened. So, what observations did you make about heating and cooling, and how do those things change the properties of matter? Uh, thank you guys, and I can't wait to see you guys for our next virtual field trip. Thank you, Mr. Dominguez. And the question that came in was, is cooling how ice is made in the freezer? And yes, it is. If you have just even stick your head in the freezer, you can see that 
Uh, it is cold in there and that is what causes water to freeze. If you take the ice out of the freezer and leave it on your countertop, it's going to heat up and melt. So you can do that easy experiment at home. All right, now I'm going to uh, share my screen one last time with you and do a quick recap of what we did today. So again, today's virtual field trip was all about matter and energy. Uh, first, we explored the properties of bigger and smaller and texture with Mr. Ramirez. Next, we explored the properties of heavier or lighter, um, also known as weight with Mr. Monroe. Third, we looked at shape and color and nature with Ms. Schramm. And then we just saw that very interesting investigation about heating and cooling with Mr. Dominguez. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We appreciate you taking the time to learn about matter and energy with us. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this virtual field trip and you can let us know whether you did or not by going to www.tiny.cc slash PK2 or PK-2 feedback and filling out a short feedback form for us. We use that information to improve what we do out here. And we hope to see you again in about three weeks for our next um, field trip for pre-K and kinder students. It's going to be on forms of energy. We'll see you again in about three weeks. Have a great day. Goodbye.